in those days, I mean, it was really, covering a beat was, it was immersion. I mean, we were like with them all the time. So, you know, commercial air, air travel and, and hotels, buses, it was like being on the team, except for the, the fame and the groupies and the money, we were like on the team. <laughs> But well, we were with them days, all the time. They didn't sell those yeah. seats. They hadn't figured it out yet. And the lowly media sat right next to the bench. And we were right on the floor where the staff crew is between the benches. And you heard a lot. And we were we were on it. So it was none of that. And he was fun back there. This All this fun comes out. And I have a lot of him. Just stuff in bars, um, in the, on the bus, in the hotel. He liked to break chops. He noticed everything. You know, he called me Scoop. You know, I wasn't particularly trustworthy or they were never that comfortable around me like I'd come into the locker room and I'd say Scoop do you notice how quiet it gets when you walk in here you know like yeah I, I can live with that and but he he was like noticed everything like you know when you go to school certain guys are in, agitated or instigators or gossips he was like one of those guys and I remember during we were in Portland and uh it was a, a forward from North Carolina State I think Kenny Carr and, and you know he coned me with a pass during the warm-ups. I was down, the head down, typing. And Aaron Pass got away and blasted me in the head. My glasses <laughs> broke and flying off. And Kenny Carr came over to Polly. And Bird's at the other end. He noticed everything. He saw that. He couldn't wait to hunt me down in the bar that night back at the hotel. But he got like 47 against some trailblazers. But all he cared about was getting in my face. He said, Scoop, I saw that. You were pissed. He says, your glasses went flying and the whole thing. You know how he could get. So, it was uh, it was that kind of like back and forth stuff, and so I just uh, I, I made every effort with Larry. I have his cell phone. He has he's turned off the faucets, and this should be obvious to you guys. But I guess if you pay him and you do a commercial or something, I, he appears. I'm glad because I was worried about his health. I know he became a granddad, and he's Social Security eligible, and <laughs> you know he's got a no show job at the Pacers now, and but most of the time in Florida. We see him at a spring training. He likes the baseball. He comes over to Fort Myers every now and then. And, you know, Indiana, but the kids are grown. I think his daughter works for the Pacers. Um, and uh, just just like I said, shut off the faucets. Uh, Max couldn't get him to help him with his book. I mean, I would take that personally if, if I played with him for nine years, whatever, and won two championships. I mean, yeah, that's just, that, that's really shutting off the faucets. And I know that like Bob Ryan and Jackie, you know, they both did biographies with Larry. They, they would stay at his house. Uh, they were in the inner circle, and he's not returning their calls either. So I didn't take it personal. He wasn't calling me back, but it helped a lot. He did not warm up to strangers well. I understood that. You know, he's shy, and he didn't like thinking people were trying to buy him or everybody needing something from him and push back on that. Didn't, you know, he wouldn't have been a social media guy if he were playing today. You know, he didn't like having his picture taken. He hated it at the airport when he was kind of found a quiet corner and some, you know, some jackass would go by and say, hey, there's Larry Bird. And then all of a sudden people were around him and want autographs and like, he just wanted his privacy. He used to go to the movies in the afternoon, Chestnut Hill. I'd see him over there. And, uh, you know, of course, we're like, how come you go to the movie? Well, number one, it was in the afternoon. There was nobody in the theater, so he could hide out. He had a hat on. And number two, it was cheaper. Matinees were cheaper with Larry. <laughs> that, that meant a lot. I actually had a, a road rage incident with him I was driving by Fenway Park. Was, you know, he lived in Brookline, down at the end of Route 9, and in fact, there where Hellenic College was. And I was getting near Fenway. I'm coming in on Park Drive, turning onto Boylston Street, and this giant Cadillac is being a real dick, the way this car is driving. It was almost as if the car was trying to provoke me. <laughs> I was really getting, I was flaring. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, I, I, I roar up against this guy, and I look over, and it's him. He just, he, he picked me out. He saw me. So he was messing with me in traffic. You know, he loved that, that he got under my skin, unknowing that it was him. I mean, that's stuff that used to happen. Well, the Celtics had a guy named Rick Roby, who was, a, you know, he's from Kentucky. He was six foot 11 listed, but Larry called him footer because he said, you're a, you're a footer, you're a seven footer. And, um, you know, Larry had a long history with this guy because Joe B. Hall had recruited him to Kentucky. Larry wanted to play at Kentucky when he was in high school. Where he lives, Kentucky was kind of the blue chip program along with Indiana to the north. And uh, Joe B. Hall thought he couldn't get a shot off in the SEC, so and they, they brought in Rick Roby, who was slower, but he was seven feet. And they won a national championship with Roby, and and um, so they end up with the Celtics together. And Roby's, to this day, still a good old boy, drinking buddy, Kentucky. Ended up moving to Florida, of course, and his son played football for the Gators. And, but uh, Roby ran with Larry. They were like-minded guys. And uh, of course, Roby was only playing like eight minutes a night. 
you know, and Larry had to get out there. And so Larry was the one paying the price for this lifestyle that they had on the road. And um, Red traded Roby for, for Dennis Johnson. He got a <laughs> Hall of Fame guard because Phoenix was, they, they gave up on this guy way too early. You know, the coach didn't like him and Red sees that opportunity. He needed a physical guard. He gets a Hall of Fame guard who's coming into the prime of his career for Rick Roby, who played, I don't know, another year or two, never did anything. Good guy. And But it wasn't just the basketball. Part of it was to get Roby the hell out of town. And Larry was MVP the next three years. It was not a coincidence. You know, it was a, a dual effect trade, bringing in an all-star guard and, and getting rid of the guy who was keeping Larry out at night. So that was part of it. it you know, like, you know, Maxwell had, Max will tell you, Max had the routine. You know, there was a McDonald's across the street. I don't know if it's still there on Causeway, but there, there was. And, you know, so he'd send Francis um, O'Brien could tell you this, the ball boy is still there. He's 70 years old. They'd go get bags of hamburgers and Max would eat a bag of hamburgers before the game. And, uh, you know, we wrote about that. And, and I, <laughs> you know, Larry's like, don't be writing about that. People think, you know, we don't take care of ourselves. He says, that's the worst part of this job, he says, is staying in shape and, you know, conditioning and diet and all that. He says, he says I'll tell you, he says, when I'm done playing, I'll be the fattest fuck you ever saw. He says, because I have no intention of, of staying with this regimen. He said, it's too hard. And he said, I'm just as bad as Max or anybody else. And, and then the one year he hurt his back, and this was a little later, and he was away from the thing for a couple of weeks, and he gained, I don't know, he said, he said, I gained like seven, 10 pounds while I was shut down for those two weeks. He said, I was eating wedding cakes every day. Why would you do that? He goes, who'd fuck up a wedding cake? They're good. You know, it was the thing. So that was uh, his mentality was, you know, a wedding cake is by definition going to be good cake. So he ate only wedding cakes while he was on the shelf and gained all this weight. So yeah, he was funny talking about that. But, you know, a guy like Robert Parrish, never gained any weight. Nobody runs a fast break better than the Boston Celtics. One of the reasons Tiny Archibald, one of his five assists in the game. Is he He's run the, the floor. He still looks like that. He's 68 years yeah. old and uh, just just stayed with, with that body. The whole Jerry Henderson was like that. I mean, I don't I don't mean to say that guys were fat and sloppy and out of shape. You can't play this sport, as you know, to do that. But it was not quite the regimen that you have to do. No, it never goes that way. I just feel like